morning. Good morning. Happy Pride Month. <laughs> Yay. Um, Karen back for day two of our all day mental health Instagram lives. Thank you for joining us on Instagram Live and thank you for joining us on the Mild Town Podcast available on iTunes and Spotify and YouTube. Um, yesterday, we did four uh, episodes of this new series that I'm trying out. We well, had an introduction and we ate breakfast together. It was very cute. Um, we discussed my bipolar experience, you're struggling, now what, and what to do if you're in crisis. So I wanted to start today off with what to do if a loved one is in crisis. Hmm, very important. We need more of this. Um, so as I touched on yesterday, you know, these topics, you guys, my followers, uh, my supporters voted on them. And this was, again, they were all split like 50-50, like everyone kind of wanted to hear from everything, which was what inspired the series and just believing and knowing that you deserve more when it comes to mental health. And I'm trying to talk about all parts of like the equation and, and, and the situation and what's going on. Um, as a mental health coach, this is the other side of my business is that I uh, offer peer support and help to individuals who don't themselves directly uh, experience mental health issues, but they have a loved one who does and they wanna know how they could better support them. A common theme with all of these episodes is that we aren't given the tools for success when it comes to either dealing with mental uh, health issues or you know, uh, being a witness and being in a supporting role to someone who does. And that is a huge part of the problem. So uh, when, when talking about this, I'm gonna be, you know, kind of providing different relationships and scenarios. Uh, and cause that's just the nature of these series. Like I wanna, I wanna try to cover as many bases as I can to help as many people as I can. But of course, if there are any questions, you know, where to find me. Um, Okay, so there are many types of relationships <laughs> and each of them are unique. So uh, for this specific episode, we're talking about what to do if a loved one is in crisis or, you know, like, I know love is a strong word, but if, if someone is in crisis that you are witnessing and could be in a role of support, but you just don't know how, uh, this can apply to, uh, you know, relationships in the workplace, like those professional relationships with coworkers or maybe your employer, um, of course, friendships, uh, romantic relationships, your partner, your wife, your husband, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your spouse, um, and family, you know, maybe a sibling um, or a parent or an aunt, uncle, all that kind of thing. This is all about uh, those individuals in a supporting role who want to better support or help someone in their life who is in crisis. Uh, even, you know, as recent as yesterday, um, someone in one of my groups posted just asking for help because they believe that their partner is in crisis um, and, you know, possibly experiencing like bipolar and what do, what do you do? Well, like, how do you, <laughs> what, like, what do, what do you do? So it's a great question. And I love, I love seeing people um, reach out and asking for peer support and advice. I think it's, it really melts my heart and I, I believe it's really special. As someone, I think maybe a lot of people would relate to this, but as someone who has had mental health issues for, for their whole life and, you know, has been in and out of relationships, uh, seeing that special, like unlocked level of understanding is really, really something. And I've been in group therapies before where there are individuals in that group therapy uh, who are just want to listen so that they can then help someone in their life. So it's possible and you can do it. And the standard has been set. So keep up. Um, okay. So despite the fact that there are many different relationships and, uh, you know, each one is unique. I was thinking that there's like just three main 
like common components in, in, in any relationship when it comes to helping someone who's in a crisis. Um, number one, you've heard this before, you can't help someone unless they wanna help themselves. And this is true. And probably one of the more like gut-wrenching because <laughs> you know I've been there you try to help someone and they're just not ready and it sucks that's a whole other thing but it's worth mentioning because it's it's just that it's like that rule right and it's, it's a whole other topic um you have to be understanding even when you don't understand okay you don't I'm not saying that you have to approach every situation with someone who's struggling and, and, and getting it and understanding, but you have to try. And even when you don't, and I know that for, for, for individuals, for people, it's really hard to conceptualize something or think of something or understand something when you just don't. And that is usually the root of like fear and hate <laughs> in society is when you don't understand something, but I'm just asking you to please try. Um, and you need to be empathetic. That is one thing I always say uh, of what we need more in the world, but in the mental community is empathy. Uh, it lacks, like, it's scary. Um, we need it. Also, um, this is another one kind of like hard, hard pill to swallow, I guess, is you have to accept that this individual may not have all the answers. And I know that that could be like really frustrating because I, I think that for a lot of people, if you're experiencing something, like if you're experiencing anxiety, you're experiencing suicidal thoughts, you're experiencing depression, et cetera, because we are experiencing it and it's our, our reality and our existence, then we should know what's going on and we should understand it, but that's not true. Um, a lot of these thoughts are uncontrollable and whether you're experiencing it for the first time or for the hundredth time, you don't like you still, it's hard to communicate and articulate what's happening or, or fully understand it. And that's why, you know, people are still studying mental health. No one, like, there's still so much more to learn about mental health disorders and treatment. We're not, we don't have it all figured out yet. And so if science doesn't have it all figured out, <laughs> And then we shouldn't put it on like the individual person to have it all figured out. Yes, it's happening to us, but we are oftentimes as much in the dark as you are, which I always like to bring up that point because it kind of goes against what you would think like immediately. Like, oh, if you're experiencing a panic attack, then you, you should know what a panic attack is and what's happening. And absolutely not. Like, you know how many people go to emergency rooms um, because they think they're having a heart attack when it turns out that it's just a panic attack? Like that is, that's another like sign and proof that again, lack of education, lack of awareness, but e even though it's happening to us, we can still not know what's going on. So by pressuring someone um, for, for answers to questions and, and um, it can be frustrating because we also don't know sometimes and especially when, when we're in such a fragile place. Um, so just like keep that in mind because a lot of people don't look at it that way. Um, it's also highly encouraged, <laughs> we did this yesterday, to do your own research, use Google. And I, you know, again, quick point, please don't use Google to diagnose someone or yourself. Don't agree with that, please don't. But if you wanna learn more um, very like baseline, basic facts um, and things about the about mental health or the disorder, then do it. Go on Facebook, join a specific mental health disorder, Facebook groups or mental health groups in your area or in your country um, and or ask your doctor, like, Ask if you have to sit down with your doctor and, and ask, ask all your questions. Go to group therapies in your town or city. That's what I see so many people in support roles do is that they find these groups and they attend. Sometimes they'll ask questions. Sometimes they'll sit there for the whole hour and just listen and absorb. That is so special to me. And I can't even express like how much I appreciate people who do that. Um, it's, I've always found that it's 
uh, empowering to um, approach it as a team, like in a team setting, <laughs> like, you know, we're a team, we're going to figure this out, we're going to get through this together. I always found that to be more helpful and encouraging than say like promises. Like I promise you that we're going to figure this out. Because making a promise like that, like you may not figure it out. <laughs> like at least not, you know, soon you could, but uh, as I mentioned in previous episodes, like I like to keep things a little bit more realistic and I don't like the whole promise route. I promise that we'll do this and do that. I like more, it's like, we're a team, we're in this together. I believe in you. I know it's hard, but we will go to the ends of the earth for you. I think that that approach uh, is, is a strong one. Um, of course, respect boundaries. Um, I do this all the time because, um, you know, I, I get it. It's as someone who has been struggling with mental health their entire life, like started showing signs of bipolar when they were seven. Um, when it, it becomes so much part of your life that I don't want to talk about it all the time. Um, and I, you know, even my mom, she'll like occasionally ask how my mental health is. And I just stop her at tracks. Like that's my boundary. I, I live with it every day. Let me have the moments in life where I forget that I have it <laughs> basically. Uh, and so, uh, just respect people's boundaries. If they set a boundary, like respect it. Um, just let them know that you'll be there for them. And of course, have an open mind. We are not a mental health aware society. Um, and when you don't, when you're not aware of something and there's no awareness or there's no education, um, and then you've just been like hounded with stereotypes and stigmas your whole life about what mental health is, uh, sometimes our mind can be quite quite closed to what our idea and, be and belief of mental health is. So go into it with an open mind. Um, you're probably going to learn something, I, <laughs> I promise you. So have an open mind for that. Um, also worth mentioning, you know, what to do if someone you know or loved one is in crisis is... Um, Safety, you know, this is the conversation that has to happen. Safety is the most important and should be uh, a priority in everyone's situation. Now, I am sitting here in my studio. I don't know anyone's situation. I haven't been in the environment in which the situation is happening. I don't know the person in crisis. So um, I'm, I'm mindful of that, right? Only you in that moment can accurately assess what's going on. And I've always been told that the safety, your safety and the safety of everyone around you and the safety of the person in crisis should be the utmost priority and up there, like the first thing you think of. And only you can make that call. Like I can't, I'm not going to sit here and say, um, you know, you have to, you have to do this. You have to call the police. You have to do this, you know, in the situation. I, I, I believe that a lot of people are, they jump to that. Like first off, I'm not a believer in that. I think it's, and I can't tell you otherwise, like, or what the situation is. It's not my place. But the first thing that you think about in the event that you're around someone who's in a crisis, like as we talked about the 10 to 10 red zone, <laughs> rock bottom crisis, is the safety of everyone. Um, and then you should make decisions based on that. Um, but the conversation goes further than that. Uh, and we have learned that in recent time, the past year, uh, if you feel that safety is an issue, um, I think a lot of people's first instinct is to call the police. And I, you know, again, I'm not in the situation, so I can't tell you not to call the police because I am not in that situation. This is just food for thought that uh, in the past year for mental health uh, situations, it has been leaning towards calling other resources first 
opposed to calling the police right away, um, just because we have been shown time and time and time and time and time again, that the police are not, um, the, probably the safe, on the, issue, on, the, on the topic of safety, the safest uh, number to call, especially when it involves individuals who are having a mental health crisis, who are uh, part of the BIPOC community. Um, so more and more uh, entities and numbers have been popping up as alternatives to call um, first to see if they can remedy the situation. Um, you know, organizations that are trained in crisis intervention, um, whereas the, the police are not. The police are not uh, appropriately trained to handle a mental health crisis. So I cannot have this conversation about how to help someone in crisis without having this conversation the very real conversation that uh, we have lost far too many uh, people of color who are having a mental health crisis based on, you know, from police intervention. So I just encourage you to look up different numbers in your area um, of organizations and entities and numbers and resources of help um, of people who can provide crisis intervention and who are trained to do so. And they should be at the top of your list of people to call. But again, I am not in the situation, only you are in the situation and only you can make that call. So if you, if you feel that it's appropriate and things are getting to a place that you know is dangerous and people's safety is being compromised, then you need to make the call that is right for you, okay? So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, so when I was doing a lot of these episodes, I was thinking about, you know, people who are adults and are in control of their own life and then also trying to be an advocate for children, um, for, for individuals who are experiencing mental health issues who are below the age of 18, who still have a parent or guardian that makes decisions for them. Uh, to me, this is really important because as someone who started showing signs at a very young age, again, I mentioned seven, um, I didn't receive help or treatment until I was 23. <laughs> and I suffered. So my whole childhood and teenage life and struggled and it was painful and it sucked. I was a diagnosed at 14, but I still, um, what, you know, wasn't given medication. And I, it's really important to me that I advocate for, for people in that age group and speak to parents and talk to parents about mental health, because I often wonder what my life would have been like if I had received the help that I needed sooner. Um, so I just want to talk about parent, guardian, or even child relationships. Maybe you're a teacher or a, you know, a family member. When you start noticing signs um, in your child and that, you know, whether they come to you, which is what I did, I went to my parents and I told them that I was self-harming and hallucinating and like exhausted from my mood swings. So I was diagnosed as bipolar um, at 14 and you know, nothing was done. Um, but so whether your child comes to you, which is amazing that they, that they did, but when, if, and when they do listen, listen to them, um, they're not doing it for attention. Uh, it needs to, and even if they are doing it for attention, then that still needs therapy. <laughs> that was like always the joke I made, I made with my mom. Cause she just thought I was self-harming for attention. And I, like, I remember thinking, okay, even if I am doing it for attention, I should still probably see a therapist because <laughs> it's just not, it just shouldn't be happening. So, um, you know, I, I want to throw that example out there because it's important because I feel that it happens a lot. So please listen to your child, um, do some research, talk to your doctor. And again, like there's, there is nothing, you have, you have nothing to, well, you have everything to lose, actually. You have nothing to lose by taking your child to get help, but then you have everything to lose by not doing it. Um, 
so for your child, like a lot of schools have guidance counselors, maybe you could set up like a regular appointment with them. Of course, that's like with the school um, or more therapy, like outside, there are lots of uh, therapists who deal with right down to toddlers. Like you just, if you go on psychologytoday.com or CA, uh, you could put in age, age ranges and then it will populate a list of therapists in your area that can help. Um, again, speak to your doctor. Lifestyle changes um, can definitely be a huge help. And if needed, medication until, again, I always say medication can be short term, right? Because I know medication that can scare a lot of people, but it can be short term. And um, I think it, if, if it's affecting quality of life to a certain degree, then it's definitely a good idea. Um, increased family involvement in self-care routines and mental health conversations. Make it a family thing. If there's siblings, loop them in on it, what's going on. Um, take, have more, figure out what the needs are of, of your family member who is in crisis and uh, make it a family routine and be more mindful of, of activities or language or which, whatever you need to do to make that person feel better and safer and help with where their anxieties are. Cause it's, again, it's very like different specific across the board, um, unique. Um, conversations with your child, of course, but I think in order to have a conversation with your child, you have to listen and be understanding. Um, I know that for me growing up, we had so many conversations about mental health in our house. Like it was, it was, it was a mental health um, free home, but yet surface value almost like it, it, it was up here, but not deeper down because when I was experiencing things, it was just my, my issues and struggles were cast aside and ignored. And so I think you have to it's, it's a lot more than the superficial having a conversation. It's about fully understanding and have the intention of wanting to do well and do better and be there, right? It's just, it's, it's a lot different. Don't just have conversations. It's like actions speak louder than words kind of thing. Um, and if they are in crisis, so this is, this is the call that I get. <laughs> This is the, so as a mental health coach, this is the call that I get from parents, which is I pick up my phone and then it's just like screaming, crying, um, panic. Um, I don't wish that for anybody. I, and this is, you know, this is why I'm doing this episode so that I can do something that I can do to make sure that you don't reach that point. If you are a parent of a child who's experienced mental health issues. Um, notice the signs, have conversations. If it reaches that point where it's level 10, <laughs> 10 um, crisis, then you have to make a decision, you know? Um, and a, a lot of the decisions, the decision that a lot of my clients make is to bring their child to a children's hospital with a psychiatric ward who could help them. And of course, that is not the easiest thing to do. Um, and I get it. And but some I've said it before, sometimes a hospital is the best safest place for someone and, and that it you sometimes it can be it has the potential to be the first step in getting your life back together. So it's just it's, a, it's an option. Um, but I, I, I think the really there, and if you're a parent, you know, join parent support groups. I think it's very important because, you know, I had a client who dropped their child off at the hospital, and then they called me and they were like, "What the f am I supposed to do now?" <laughs> I was like, "I know," <laughs> and you have lots of questions, right? Like you, you need answers, and so I try to provide as many answers as I can, and um, it's. And it's a unique experience, you know what I mean? So I think it's important to, to just reach out and get support uh, so that you can support yourself and then support your loved one. Uh, okay, 
So if you're a loved one or if you're concerned about someone, um, you know, as we mentioned earlier, the endless list of possibilities, a friend, a coworker, a romantic partner, um, it's okay to talk to them. Um, so in another one of my groups, see, you just, I need to compile a list of like what not to do in situations because y'all are doing a lot of not what to do out in the world. Um, so there was this individual who was working and, you know, she mentioned that like, she, she just was in a bad place, just not doing much, depressed, uh, suicidal thoughts. And, um, you know, as she was at her job and they told her to go home um, because she was just depressed and whether they knew it or not. But, and so she left and she said that she, she just sat in her car for, you know, we've all been there. <laughs> she just sat in her car um, for, you know, a little bit. She cried and just sat there. She just said she needed to, you know, she was upset. She was sad and she just had to collect her thoughts before she started to drive home because that was the safe thing to do, like get it all out and then drive home safely. But in the time that she was in the car in the parking lot, her her employer had called the cops on her and the cops had come to the parking lot and circled her car. So <laughs> it's just one of those things like, were there other ways you could have went about that? Absolutely. So it's, it's, it's all about talking about it and you can talk to someone about their mental health I don't know where this thing is where you can't like it's just you don't you don't speak about it if you talk about it it becomes real <laughs> but like please do you know and and if the it, it, again if the person sets a boundary and doesn't want to talk about it then you tried but it's okay to approach someone who you believe and perceive to be struggling and just see what's going on I know that saved my life. Like in Montreal, I mentioned yesterday in an episode um, that if it wasn't for a coworker coming to me and sitting me down and then me pouring out all this stuff and being admitted to the hospital, I don't know how that would have turned out. Um, this, this always seemed like super obvious to me. I made a note here to say it because I've done a lot of mental health courses um, the past couple months. And one thing I find that lacks in all of them is, is that just ask someone what they need. I think with a lot of mental health conversations, we dehumanize people. And it's okay to ask someone, what do you need? Like, what do you need? Do you need, do you need time alone? Do you need to go to the hospital? Do you need me to call someone? Do you need to call your doctor? Um, do you need a shoulder to cry on? Do you need a coffee? Do you need like food? Uh, just like, what do you need? We never ask that. <laughs> we never ask that to people who are struggling. And I don't know if it's because like, like we like, you know, what's better, like on the other end or something, but it's okay to ask people when they're struggling or in crisis like what they need because they'll tell you or they or like they, they also don't know which I've seen a lot um they, so like when my clients in crisis uh in family settings what do you need it either results in like I need help I need to go to the hospital and then it's like cool awesome done or it's like, I don't know. And then that is a different conversation, um, but it tells a lot. Like they also don't know. So let's brainstorm some ideas. Um, again, it goes back to just being on the same team. Like I it just, it's okay to have conversations with someone when they're struggling and in crisis. Uh, I mentioned it earlier as well. Like it's really great to do your own research and learn about the different disorders of those around you um, by learning and researching and educating yourself, then you can be a better support system because you know more of what they're going through. But most importantly, you probably read along the way some ways that you could help and be a stronger person and support person for that individual. The more you know about how they're feeling and the more that you can help. Um, again, if you just reminding everybody, if you are in a situation 
uh, where you are concerned about your safety or the safety of others, then take actions to make sure everyone can get into a safe space. Um, yeah, so that's, that's today's episode of how to help somebody, a loved one, if they are in crisis. Um, I hope that helped. <laughs> and again, just look at the resources available to you. There are so many, uh, you know, now as well, like virtual uh, support groups and Facebook groups where you can just take the initiative and go in and learn more. Um, I know it's tough. Uh, like, you know, I see, I see my partner uh, all the time, kind of his role in watching me in crisis and trying to help me and support me. And it sucks. Like it's, <laughs> it's really hard, especially when it gets bad. And, and I've, you know, I've also sat in rooms before with, you know, because part of mental health coaching is I, I call it like compassionate intervention. So I'll go and speak to people who don't know how to help themselves and are kind of scared and just talk about our options. And I've been in the room with supportive individuals like husbands and parents. And it just, it breaks my heart, the fear and the panic, um, because it is scary. You don't know what's happening. And again, like so many things have led to uh, you being in this position that are beyond your control, lack of education, lack of awareness, all the stigmas, all the stereotypes that have been perpetuated <laughs> since the beginning of time. Um, and so it's not like entirely your fault, but it is your responsibility to step up and learn and engage and um, challenge all those inner biases and, and everything that you, you thought mental health was. And so I applaud everyone who, who takes the initiative and, and wants to learn more because you are playing a huge role in making life just a safer and better place for individuals with disabilities and chronic illness and mental health disorders. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching this episode. Uh, you can learn more about me by clicking the link in my Instagram bio, www.beacons.ai slash Karen Inder. And of course my podcast and the bio and all that good stuff. So I am here if you need me. Thank you guys so much for the first episode of day two. And we will be back um, in 30 minutes where we talk about suicide. So thank you guys so much for your support. Have a great day. Bye.